we're going to talk about another force law, uh, about a force altogether different from gravity or contact forces. We're going to talk about the electrostatic forces between two electric charges. We are all familiar with the idea of static electricity, the somewhat mysterious op ability for things to electrostatically attract one another. And we've heard about things like opposites attract and likes repel. A scientist by the name of Francois Coulomb empirically derived a force equation for two charges, Q1 and Q2, and how their fo the force between them relates to their charge and their separation. In this force law, which reads that the force of charge number one acting on charge number two is proportional to a constant and some charges and the distance between them, the following are the quantities that appear in this force law. First, there's the distance between the two charges. R12 is actually a vector. It is the vector that points from charge number one to charge number two. The constant k in MKS units is given by one over four times pi times another constant epsilon sub zero. This constant epsilon sub zero in the MKS unit system is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 coulomb squared per newton times meter squared. If you'll notice when epsilon naught is in the denominator, then it cancels the two fac factors of coulombs for the two charges in the numerator of coulombs force law. And the newton meter squared comes up in the numerator. And the meter squared will be canceled by the one over r squared in full coulombs force law. Therefore, the units of force come out properly to newtons. The other uh, piece of Coul Coulomb's force law be besides this constant and the distance between the two objects are then the two charges, Q1 and Q2, and this unit vector right here. A unit vector is a vector that has only a magnitude of 1, and it has uh, the, the direction of the original vector R12. So what Coulomb's force law says is that if the, for, the radius vector R12 points from 1 to 2, the force that is experienced by charge number 2 also points along this line. If the two charges have the same uh, sign to them, they're both positive or they're both negative, then the force of number 1 acting on number 2 points in the same direction as R12. In the particular drawing I've made here, these two charges have the opposite sign and therefore the force points in the opposite direction as R12. This, is our, this matches our intuition because if we want opposite charges to attract, then the force has to point on number two, has to point back toward number one. Some points of note. As we'll talk about in just a moment, Newton's third law of motion, which is that if object A exerts a force on object B, then object B exerts an equal and opposite force on object A. That's built into Coulomb's force law, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. This force is somewhat different from other forces we are familiar with in that it is action at a distance. The two charges do not necessarily have to be in contact one another, with one another in order to experience a force from each other. And in fact, Coulomb was able to derive empirically what is the relationship between the distance between the two objects and the, two, and the force on them. And what he found is that the further away the objects were, then the, the weaker the force, and that mathematical relationship fell off as 1 over the distance squared. That means that the force gets rather strong as the objects get close together, either it's an attractive or repulsive force, uh, and gets rather weak as they become further separated. Coulomb's for empirical law also has the intuition built into it <coughs> that opposites will attract and like charges will repel. Because for like charges, the product of Q1 times Q2 in the numerator will always be positive. That happens whether they're both negative or they're both positive. And in this case, the force of one acting on number two has the same direction as the unit vector R of, from number one over to, R number, to charge number two. Let's revisit what Newton's third law says. Newton's third law asks that if charge number one exerts a force on charge number two, then charge number two must exert an equal and opposite force on charge number one. In other words, if 
this is the force arrow acting on number two from number one, then we must find a way that Coulomb's force law creates a force on number one from number two that has the same magnitude but the opposite direction. Coulomb's force law actually ensures this because in the force law itself is the direction of the force, the, the separation between the two charges. So if we were to look at what is the radial separation from two going to number one, this is opposite in sign to r going from one over to two. In other words, they have the same length but the opposite direction. Then, when we want to ask what is the force on number one acting on number two, the force of number one acting on number two, this will have r12 in it. But if we were to instead ask what is the force from number two acting on number one, this has r21 in it, both in the denominator down here and the unit vector right there. The separation down the denominator is opposite in sign, but if we square it, it becomes the same. And there is a minus sign that results then when we go back to r12 because of this unit vector. This last term is opposite in sign to that. As a result, Coulomb's law does properly give us that the force on number one is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction as the force on charge number two. So this is the nature of Coulomb's force law. He had to empirically derive it by taking different charges of different magnitudes and different relative signs and placing them at different distances and directly measuring what is the force experienced by the two objects. After making a series of measurements, he was able to conclude that it, the force that's experienced is related to the product of the two charges and is related inversely to the distance squared of the separation between them.